Hello and welcome to One Hope Church Online. Glad to have you tonight. Thank you for being a part of the broadcast, a part of the teaching. If you would, if you're watching by Facebook Live, would you share the broadcast? Invite other people to tune in to this night's teaching here on Wednesday night. We're so glad and happy to have you again as always. Also, if you're watching by YouTube and you have not subscribed, would you subscribe to the channel? Like the channel, let us know that you're a part of the teaching. Comment if you can, either you're watching by uh, YouTube or by Facebook. Let us know that you're here with us tonight. We're happy to have you. Have you as you notice over the past few weeks, we have changed up the format here on Wednesday night. We're no longer entering the service, particularly with praise and worship like we normally would on Sundays or on Wednesday nights. But we're going directly into the Word of God. And we're really formatting Wednesday nights to become a discipleship night. And Brother Ricky, over the past couple of weeks, he has really gave us a taste of what the Wednesday nights are going to look like. And tonight we're going to officially begin what we're calling Rooted in the Word Discipleship. Rooted in the Word Discipleship. The Lord has spoken to Pastor Greg and myself about taking the mandate to make disciples very serious. And so this time here on Wednesday nights, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be focusing on teachings from the Word of God that will help all of us become stronger disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way you really can become a strong disciple of Jesus Christ is to be rooted in His Word. And so for the next, I don't know how long, maybe a year or two, we're going to be focusing here on our midweek service on discipleship. And tonight we're going to begin officially an eight, maybe to... 10 to 12 week teaching called Firm Foundations, a basic and biblical discipleship. Firm Foundations, a basic and biblical discipleship. And so we're going to be looking at the basics of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you've been saved for any amount of time, what we're going to be discussing tonight is um, going to be very familiar but I, I think if you're like me, it's, it's good to rehash and to go over even some of the very basic fundamental teachings of our faith. And so that's what we're going to begin tonight. Part one of Firm Foundations, a basic and biblical discipleship. You know, let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you will. Father, we just love you tonight. We praise you. We pray that you would bless our time together. We pray, Lord, as we break open the bread of life, which is your word. As we begin to dig in tonight and over the next few weeks, that Lord, we, many of us would grow deeper in our roots, that our faith would run deeper, God, to every area of our lives. And so, Father, we're praying tonight as we begin this new teaching on firm foundations, that Father, it would help each and every one of us in this season of life that we're all living in to be rooted even deeper in your word. And so we bless you. We pray you bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, anyone who wants God's best for their life must begin with a strong foundation. Jesus said as much when he said in Luke chapter 6, verses 47 and 48. He said in verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on that on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. He then goes on to contrast the wise ones with the foolish ones who heard the same message as the wise ones heard. But they failed to act and found himself living in a house built on sand. Spiritually speaking, we need our houses founded on the rock. We don't need our lives built upon the sand. You see, both, both of these people, they had their works tested by the storms of life. And it seems like in today's world, storms are coming faster than ever before. And they look like, like they've never looked before. And so in this real life game of survivor that we read here in Luke chapter 6, only one person was left standing. The one who chose to build his life on a firm foundation. 
And so as this story illustrates, when the storms of life hit us, and believe me, if you've not experienced them yet, storms do hit us. They hit us as Christians. They hit us. And so it's important that when storms do hit us, that we build our lives spiritually on a firm foundation. Not on a foundation that's made of sand, that's fickle, that when the, light, the lightest storm comes, it blows the house down, spiritually speaking. But we're aiming to build our lives upon a solid rock. And that is to have a solid understanding or a better understanding of God's word and who the person of Jesus Christ is. Is. And those are the firm foundations that we're talking about. Building our lives upon the Word of God and knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ much better. In John's Gospel, it tells us that Jesus did many other incredible things that were not written or recorded in the New Testament writings. So much so, in fact, that if they were written down, John says in, in John chapter 21, verse 25, that if everything that Jesus did... While he was on the earth was recorded. That the world wouldn't have enough room to contain the writings. Think about that. But what was recorded in the gospels that we hear, that we read in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. And that believing you and I may have life in his name. That's what it says in John chapter 20. Verse 31. Let me go ahead and say this too. I forgot to say this in the beginning. There's going to be many Bible references. Many verses and, script and chapters that we're going to be talking about tonight. And I'm encouraging you now to go ahead and prepare to have your Bible. Go ahead and have a pen and a paper. You're going to want to write down these verses, these chapters of the different books that we're going to be talking about. And then until we meet again next week, go ahead and take time to study those verses yourself. You see, to be a strong disciple in Jesus Christ, it's going to take more than just 30 minutes that you and I have together or 40 minutes that we have together tonight. You're going to have to dig a little deeper on your own. And so I encourage you right now, I'm going to give you the Bible references there on the screen. Write them down. Take this week, take the time this week and read and dig into the word of God yourself. Amen. And so in John chapter 20, verse 31, it says that what we have in the word of God was written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God and believing that we may have life in his name. And so over the next eight weeks, maybe 10 weeks, 12 weeks, I don't know how long we're going to be in this firm foundation series, but it won't be no longer than 12 weeks. Myself and the other pastors, we're going to be presenting some teaching that is designed as a tool to help you and I to establish a firm foundation in our, feet, in our faith. However, we have to remember that a foundation is only the first step in the construction process of a well-built house. Okay? And so, in just eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it might be, uh, teaching time, we could not... Teach an all-inclusive or exhaust each subject that we're going to be discussing. Now, there's eight different um, subjects that we're going to be discussing, but we may have to stretch those eight discussions out or eight teachings out to about 12 weeks and break a few of those in two-part uh, series. But it's impossible to exhaust everything in even 12 weeks that we're going to be discussing um, out of these different teachings here. In fact, a lifetime of study... And devotion in the word of God will never exhaust God's word. Amen. And so let's go ahead and begin in night one, subject one. Let's go ahead and dive into the teaching and see where we go from here. Now, the first place we have to, uh, or we should begin to have a firm foundation spiritually, is the place where it all begins. The place where it all starts. We're going to look at tonight's subject and talk about salvation. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And let's go ahead and address the, the question or the matter of where did God come from? It does us little good to ask where God comes from. He has always been and he will always be. He is the Alpha and the Omega, which is the beginning and the end. We have to simply accept by faith this fact that God has always been and he will always be. And so we talk about faith. We're talking about being certain 
that um, uh, certain of things that we do not yet see. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right, And so we have faith, we have a trust and a belief in a God that we cannot see, but we believe in that God by faith. We trust that he is the substance of things hoped for. We realize that God is alive. We can look, according to Romans chapter 1, we can look at creation and realize that there is a creator. Amen. And so by faith, it does no good to say, hey, or ask the question or, or to mull or to uh, spend a whole lot of time. Where did God come from? By faith, we, be, we believe that he has always been and he always will be and that he is creator God. But besides being creator God, he is father God. He has revealed himself in the person of father, son, and Holy Spirit. And in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it says that God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. And so thus we see that God did not create man necessarily to look like himself. That is having black hair or blonde hair or blue eyes or green eyes or a light complexion or a dark complexion. God created man as himself. Not necessarily to look like himself, but as himself. That is as a living spiritual being, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And as God has this, uh, as, as being created as God, as a living spiritual being, we, we have a need to express love and companionship like God. All humanity does. And see, God created you and I for love and companionship. We have that, we have that essential quality of God inside of us. That is to be loved and to love and to have companionship. And so man, which was made up of Adam and Eve... They enjoyed this fellowship with God in the, in the Garden of Eden until they disobeyed God and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 and then Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. And then immediately after they disobeyed God and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were opened and they realized that they were physically naked. Before they, were, before they ate from that fruit, they had no clue that they were roaming around physically naked. But as soon as they ate, their eyes were open. And they could realize that they were physically naked. And so sin, or sin really defined as disobedience to God, or really in its purest form means missing the mark. Sin means missing the marks. God has set a standard. He has set a mark. But when you and I... Uh, move away from that mark and go to something else or do something else other than that thing that he has set forth for us to do or he told us to do, we've sinned. We've been disobedient to God. And so when Adam and Eve did that, sin had entered the world and then fellowship with God was destroyed. And so man at that moment was in need of salvation. And so Adam and Eve, what did they do when they found out that they were actually physically naked. The Bible says that they went and they found and they sewed some fig leaves to cover themselves. Trying to cover their sins is what they were trying to do. You see, man's attempt at covering his own sin is insufficient. You and I could not cover our own sin. In fact, this is the definition of what religion looks like. Man's attempt to reach God by his own works and his own effort. Whereas Christianity, on the other hand, might be defined as God's attempt to reach fallen man. It is where God came to cover you and I. He came to touch you and I. He came to restore you and I. And so we should take note that it was God actually who came walking in the cool of the evening. And it was, and it was God who made garments of skin for Adam and Eve to wear to cover themselves. We find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Why did God find, feel like, why did he see a need to cover Adam, Adam and Eve there? Well, why were the fig leaves not enough? Well, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it states, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. There is no remission 
of sin. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make an atonement. That word atonement in its purest form means to cover. God said, I have given it to you to make a, a covering for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement or covering for one's life. And so we see here that clearly blood must be shed in order for sins to be forgiven. But it couldn't be just any old blood. It couldn't be the blood of another sinner being shed for another sinner. All right? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, we see the first type of blood sacrifice when God actually killed an animal and he made skins to cover Adam and Eve rather than the fig leaves that they had tried to use. And we see the first blood sacrifice that Jesus would ultimately fulfill as he died on the cross for you and I. As he shed his blood to be our atonement or to be our covering. He became our sin covering. Our sin trespass. Our sin offering there on the cross. You see, all the Old Testament sacrifices are but a shadow. A veiled image of the sacrifice that God would give when he gave his only begotten son on the cross. And God gave Jesus for the whole world, that the whole world, that if they would come to him, would be saved. And since all mankind are descendants of Adam, we all came from Adam. Red, yellow, black, and white, we're all precious in God's sight. Every one of us came from Adam. We can understand because of that fact, Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned. Why? Because we come from the seed of Adam. We, we, we inherit his sin when we were born into this world. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Adam fell in the garden, all humanity fell at that moment. Everyone that would come throughout the ages would have failed to miss the mark that God had set there originally in the garden. And then Romans 5, 18 and 19 explains how one man sinned, Adam, and again made us all sinners. So also through the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. And so how Adam sinned and we inherited his sin through the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, and what he did there at the cross, as many that come to him will be righteous as he is righteous. And since we have all have sinned, and we've been separated from God and fellowship with him, we are all in need of restoration of that relationship with God. And, 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 and we refer to that restoration as salvation. And so when I'm talking about salvation tonight, we're, told, we're talking about being reconciled or restored back into right relationship with God the Father. And the only one way one can do that is through salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And so being saved means being saved from the judgment of God that God will bring upon the world because of sin. Of which the greatest sin in all of the world today is the rejection of his son Jesus Christ. The greatest sin that has taken place in the world today is the rejection of receiving Jesus Christ as one's Lord and Savior. And so in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, it reminds us that if we neglect God's plan for us and accept Jesus Christ and come into relationship with God the Father through him, we'll get what our sin deserves. And so the Bible says, for the wages or the payment of sin is death. What is the payment for sin? It's death. That's what the Bible says here in Romans 6, 23. But it goes on to say in Romans 6, 23, it tells us that the gift of God is eternal life. That is life forever in the presence of God. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God that he wants to give to all humanity is eternal life. You see, a gift is something that, that someone gives you. You didn't work for that gift. You didn't earn that gift. 
If you did, it would not be a gift. It'd be a payment for something that you've done. But a gift is something that is freely given by another, by others because of the love that they have for us or even their concern for us. But they give us a gift. And so it is with God's gift of salvation. We didn't earn it. We couldn't work for it. No one could be good enough to have it. It's something that God freely gives us out of his grace, out of his love and his concern for all of humanity. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace, unmerited favor, unlimited love of God, you have been saved through faith, a trust and a belief in the grace of God and what he has done for us. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So none of us can brag that we have been good enough to earn salvation. That we're, we're saved because we've merited it. No, absolutely not. It was a free gift that we inherited by faith. By God's grace through faith. Can you say amen to that? That's a good place to say amen right there. And so we see that we receive salvation as a gift of God. But we also see from the scriptures that until someone receives this gift, they are still lost in their sins. They're still a sinner. They're still awaiting God's judgment for their sin. And so the question is tonight, if you're watching here, how then can sinful man understand that when I say man, I mean man and woman, receive God's favor and the gift of salvation. I want you to do this tonight or sometime this week. I want you to get in your Bibles and read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. I don't actually have this on the screen, but something that I felt like I needed to address and have you guys to read this week. But we're talking about how do we receive this gift of salvation? How do we receive God's favor? I want you to read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21 this week, if you will. And then read 2 Peter 3 and 9. And then go on to read Romans 10, verses 11 through 13. Powerful stuff. And it will help, it will help bring some understanding to that question. How do I receive God's favor and salvation? Well, maybe you're watching tonight. And your life spiritually is on an uncertain foundation. Maybe spiritually speaking, you're like the man that we talked about in the very beginning of the message. Your house is actually built upon a sand foundation. What do you do? How do you earn salvation? Or how do you receive, I should say? You can't earn it. How do you receive this free gift of salvation and God's favor? Let me close with these three things that every one of us have to do. Number one, it all begins with your belief system. And you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. That He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Creator. And that God had raised Jesus from the dead. And you can read Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 to hear that. But you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That He is the Son of God. That He is the Creator and Sustainer of life. And that God the Father raised Him from the dead on the third day. You must believe that he went to Calvary's cross for your sin. That he became your sin offering. For he, who made, he, for he who knew no sin became sin for us. Really what that simply means is this. He became our sin offering. He became our sin offering there on the cross. That's the first thing you must believe. You must believe in Jesus Christ and what he did there at the cross for us. And that God raised them from the dead. You can read Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. The second thing you got to do is you got to confess your sins. And you've got to admit that you are a sinner and lost without God's grace and his mercy. And that you're separated from God because of sins. And you're in need of restoration. Look, that's so important. Because unless you admit that you're a sinner... You'll go on believe, believing that you can earn your salvation. That you can be good enough. But I think it's inherently true that every one of us know that we need salvation. 
We know that we need a Savior because of the sins in our life. And so we can be sure that according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the moment you confess the blood that Jesus spilled there on the cross, shed there on the cross, it comes and it washes you clean. And it restores that dead man that we inherited from Adam and Eve there in the garden. He brings to life that dead man, which is our spirit man on the inside. That blood becomes the covering of our sin. And it forgives all of our sins. God washes our sins away and cleanses us and makes us righteous as Christ is righteous. As we inherit his righteousness. Wow, that's awesome. And then the third thing you need to do. So you're confessing of your sin, but this is a, this is a point that most people for, forget and, and leave off. But first, you've got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. That he went to the cross for your sins and God raised him from the dead. Then you've got to confess your sins. And ask God to forgive you. Come into your life and to cleanse you by his blood. Purify you from all unrighteousness. As 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says. But then you got to repent of your sins. Saying sorry is not enough. Many say that they're sorry. But then they go out and continue the same lifestyle. That they've always lived. You see Peter told the crowds on the day of Pentecost. As he was preaching. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38. He said to repent. That means to turn from your sin. Turn to God. You see, it's as one as that is walking in the wrong direction. But when you repent, you turn and you go into the right direction. And so repentance actually means to change your mind about your sins. Change your mind about the world system. And you turn your mind back to God. You give your life to God. You've repented. You're not just confessing of your sins, but you're turning from those sins. And you're heading in the right direction. And so accompanying our confession of sin must be a willingness to forsake our sin. And to change our attitude about sin. You'll notice that when you get saved, we're talking about salvation. You'll no longer like the things that you used to like. The things that used to make you happy. Certain things, not everything of course. But things that you know today are sin. That bring pleasure to your life. Will no longer bring pleasure. You see, the Bible says, for the pleasures of sin are for but a season. There was a wage, a payment to be paid for it. And the Bible says it's death. And so we, turn, we confess it and then we turn from it. We turn from it. And so repentance is a condition demanded of the sinner by God. In order that his sins may be wiped out. And that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In Acts chapter 3 verse 19. And so you ask, well, what if I struggle? What if I continue to struggle with my sin? Well, we're going to be discussing this question quite a bit over the next few weeks, eight to ten weeks or so. But let me close with this. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. He says, for I desire to do what is good. Now, Paul at this time, we believe, was saved. He still had a desire to do what is good. But I cannot carry it out. In other words, I want to do right, but, I, but I'm, I'm struggling to do right. Every one of us have, have been there. Myself included and everybody else that maybe you look, to, look, look up to spiritually. We've all been there. We want to do certain things that we know is right. We know the word of God says not to do it. But yet we have times where we struggle to do the right thing. But he goes on to tell us that we, we have a struggle in our body with sin. And so that so so yeah, we're saved now. We we've, we've done those three things that I've confessed that I've already talked about. But we have we still have to remember we're contending with an old nature. We have a new nature because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. We got a new nature, but we still contend at times with the sin nature. And so what do we do from there? 
It's important that you remember as a born-again Christian, now that you're saved, you're not contending alone. You're not fighting alone. You're not walking alone. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. And you can read verses 5 through 17 this week. But it teaches us not to be controlled by our sin nature, but by the Holy Spirit. You see, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the grave, the moment you got saved now lives in you. And so you're not contending alone. You're not battling the sin nature alone. Now you have a new nature and you've got to learn how to live in the new nature just as you did in the old nature. You've been doing that a long time. You've been sinning a long time. And so I think some people believe that they can get saved and then with the same day, they can stop sinning totally the same day. Well, let me go ahead and give you some good news. In this body of flesh, I say good news because many live under guilt and condemnation. Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation, guilt, and shame to those that are in Christ Jesus who do not walk or live according to the flesh, but by the Spirit. You see, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to sin from time to time. But we've got to remember that if we confess the blood of Jesus Christ washes us clean. And so you're not contending alone when you're fighting against the sin nature. You're not going to be perfect. That's why I say this is good news because some of you are living under guilt and condemnation. The moment you got saved and you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, you believe that by faith. It's a faith process. It's a faith walk. We're continuing to work out our salvation through the process of sanctification. And we're going to talk about that some more, so I won't go too, too deep in that tonight. I'm just here to tell you, you're still going to have struggle, even after being born again. But you're not in that struggle alone. You've got God, the Holy Spirit, that now lives in you to help to keep that sin nature dormant. Yeah, it's still there, but it's not alive in your life. Yeah, it's still trying to be raised up, but the Spirit of God helps keep him in the grave. Because you were crucified with Christ the moment you believed in him. Your old nature was crucified, according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And then I'm going to leave you with this tonight in Galatians chapter 5, verses, six, verses 16 through 21. It tells us to crucify and to put to death the deeds of of the flesh the old nature when the bible talks about the flesh in the new testament most of the time it's not talking about the body here it's not talking about skin it's talking about the sin nature and so galatians 5 tells us to crucify and put to death the deeds of the flesh the works of the flesh how we do this by submitting to god we do this by getting into his word daily because to totally uh, walk out of the sin nature, you got to have a renewed mind. Your mind needs to be renewed. Your mind is renewed by the Word of God. Read Romans uh, chapter 12. Powerful, powerful chapter about the renewal of the mind. But we do that by submitting to God, getting into to His Word every day, and allowing Him through His Holy Spirit to live, to rule, and reign in our lives. And so I pray that tonight, as you and I are getting rooted into the Word of God, as we're building up our firm foundation in our faith, that as we begin to discuss the topic of salvation, that something that was said tonight, cut on a spiritual light bulb in your life. And that bulb is sitting there bright now, and you're understanding, you know, I understand what it means to be saved tonight. If you want to grow in your faith, if you want to have a firm foundation, it all begins with salvation. Amen. Maybe you want to accept Jesus tonight as your Lord and Savior. And as I gave you those three points on how one does that and receives the gift of salvation. You just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me there on the cross. I realize that I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness tonight by faith. I believe that you died for me there on the cross. And that God the Father raised you up on the third day. I believe in that. So tonight I confess that I am a sinner. I repent. I'm turning from those sin, sins. And I receive you by faith. Forgive me in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. If you've prayed that, let us know that you've prayed that. We'd love to give you a packet. We'd love to, to, to give you a Bible. And to help you grow in the knowledge of the Word of God. 
Well, God bless you. Thank you again for being with us tonight here at One Hope Online. Have a great week. God bless.